Okay, hello, and welcome to the Nurse Case Management of Drug-Resistant Tuberculosis webinar. I'm Kelly Musoke, the Director of Education at the Curry Center, and I'll be facilitating today's training. I'm also here with Dominique Remnick, our program assistant. We have over 600 participants joining us today from across the United States, and today's session is being recorded. We will archive the recording on our website and our YouTube channel by next week. You've all been placed on mute in order to preserve the quality of the recording, and for this reason, we ask that you reserve all questions and comments for the question and answer period at the end of the training. This webinar is produced by the Curry International Tuberculosis Center, which is part of the University of California, San Francisco, and located in Oakland, California. The Curry Center is one of five regional tuberculosis training and medical consultation centers in the United States, and we cover the states in the Western region. This project was funded by the Centers for Disease Control Cooperative Agreement and is a project of the University of California, San Francisco. The Curry International Tuberculosis Center is accredited by the ACCME to provide continuing medical education for physicians. The center is also an approved provider of continuing education by the California State Board of Registered Nurses. This webinar is approved for a total of 1.25 continuing education contact hours. To receive your continuing education contact hours, you must have registered for the webinar, participated in the entire training, and complete the online evaluation. The evaluation link was emailed to all registered participants this morning, and please note that this evaluation link cannot be shared. Both of today's faculty have signed a declaration of disclosure and have indicated they will present on the off-label use of second and third line tuberculosis drugs. Here's an overview of today's training. And these are the learning objectives for this webinar. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's faculty members. Uh, Lisa started her career in public health as a health educator in Niger, West Africa, as a Peace Corps volunteer. She went to nursing school at UCSF after returning from West Africa. Lisa has worked in TB for 14 years and is currently the MDR Nurse Coordinator for the California TB Control Branch. Leslie has worked in TB Control for more than 15 years and has been with the California TB Branch since 2007. She is a nurse consultant for the MDR TB Service and is part of the Outbreak Response Team. Okay, so now I will turn the virtual microphone to Leslie. Thank you, Kelly. Um, my name is Lisa True, and um, Leslie and I are going to be talking about nurse case management of drug-resistant TB, and we're going to present a specific case to illustrate the role of the nurse case manager in managing the side effects for the case, and actually uh, um, also managing side effects of contacts who may be on treatment. So I'm actually really excited to talk about this topic because nurses play a really important role in caring for patients with drug-resistant TB. Increasingly, we see that patients with MDR-TB have good treatment outcomes if they stay on treatment. But um, staying on treatment can be challenging due to the side effects, the long duration of treatment, and the financial and social costs from not being able to work or to go to school during the initial part of treatment. So nursing care is really critical to guide and support patients through treatment, to identify and minimize side effects. And nurses, as we'll talk about today, also play um, a role in potentially preventing future cases. All right. So to get everybody um, awake, we have our first polling question. And I just wanted to find out how many of you out there have ever been involved in caring for a patient with drug-resistant TB. So you can go ahead. Yeah. 
All right. Great. Um, so it looks like about two-thirds of you have been involved. And so some of this may sound familiar to you. Um, but for those of you who haven't been involved in caring for an MDR patient, I just wanted to highlight that there are a lot of resources out there to help, help you. And hopefully this presentation will give you an idea of the types of issues that may come up and also, again, to show you the re um, resources that are out there to help you. Okay, now I'm going to turn it over to Leslie, and she's going to present um, the case. Thanks, Lisa. Hello, everyone. I'm going to be starting out the presentation by describing this case of multidrug resistant, or MDR, tuberculosis. The case is a 20-year-old U.S.-born male who presented to his local emergency department in January of 2014 with a three-month history of cough, shortness of breath, and recent hemoptysis. He was admitted to the hospital and found to be sputum smear positive and cavitary on chest x-ray and CT scan. The local health jurisdiction luckily suspected drug resistance in this patient because a relative of his had been diagnosed and treated for MDR-TB in the past. Because of this, the case manager had a specimen sent to the state lab for molecular drug resistance testing. Our state microbial diseases lab does pyrosequencing, or PSQ, which looks for mutations for isoniazid, rifampin, the injectables, and the quinolones. This table shows the pyrosequencing results. I'm not going to go into detail about interpreting molecular drug resistant results, as there are a lot of nuances. Molecular testing is a very exciting and dynamic field at the moment, and we're learning more and more about the significance of certain mutations. Since MDR-TB is a lab-based diagnosis, it is important to communicate with your lab about the results for the best interpretation and understanding. So if you take a look at this table, you can see the results column, the third column there. You can see that mutations were detected for isoniazid and rifampin. We know that both of these particular mutations confer resistance, so now we have a diagnosis of MDR-TB. In the hospital, TB was suspected, <clears throat> and the patient was started on the standard four-drug regimen of isoniazid, rifampin, ethambutol, and pyrazinamide. Once MDR-TB was suspected, moxifloxacin and IV amikacin were added to the regimen. After the pyrosequencing results were available, isoniazid and rifampin were discontinued and additional drugs were added. So the patient's beginning expanded regimen was ethambutol, pyrazinamide, amikacin, moxie, ethionamide, linazolid, cycloserine, and vitamin B6. Another specimen was sent to CDC for additional molecular drug testing, and that's not an uncommon practice to send specimens to both CDC and the state lab. And the main reason for sending to CDC is that they also do molecular testing for pyrazinamide and ethamutol, as well as the injectables and fluoroquinolone. So let's talk briefly about MDR treatment principles. I'd like to first point out that while the nurse case manager will not be prescribing TB medications, it is their role to be familiar with the components of an MDR TB regimen. That way, if you have a known MDR TB case who is only on two drugs, you'll be able to talk with your clinician and get the patient on an appropriate regimen. Getting expert consultation for MDR TB patients is also highly recommended. And in this case, the TB program consulted with the state MDR-TB service. The decision to start an expanded empiric regimen is determined by the level of suspicion for drug-resistant TB and the severity of illness in the TB patient. The clinician will assess for severity of illness in the patient, whether they have had previous treatment for TB, and the resistance pattern of any known source case. So an, an expanded empiric regimen should have four to six drugs to which the isolate is susceptible and not previously used. The regimen should include a bactericidal injectable and a fluoroquinolone. Typically, the injectable is given for six to 12 months post-culture conversion. After the injectable is discontinued, the patient will continue at least three oral drugs for the entire treatment, which typically lasts at least 18 to 24 months after culture conversion. 
And as always, never add a single drug to a failing regimen. So these are the results from the CDC molecular testing of drug resistance. And it showed that thambutol resistance was likely, but that the silent PZA mutation was likely to not be clinically significant. So a thambutol was dropped from the regimen, and now the regimen consists of PZA, amikacin, moxie, ethionamide, linazolid, cycloserine, and B6. Well, now that the patient is on and tolerating this expanded regimen, he's still smear positive, but he's also medically stable and ready to be discharged. But can he be discharged home? He has his own bedroom in the family apartment. The household consists of a father who is TST negative, excuse me, TST positive, a mother who is TST negative, and two adult brothers who are both TST positive with pending chest x-rays. There is no one in the home under the age of five or with any immunocompromising conditions. So we have a polling question again. So after my description there of the patient tolerating treatment while hospitalized for discharge, would you discharge this patient back to the apartment? Okay, I see the numbers coming in, and it looks like we're kind of equal. Okay, that's interesting. All right, um, great. So I'll let you know what, this, what the local health department did. He was discharged home with the following plan. Oh. So the patient was um, discharged home, and the, the instructions were to avoid the use of central air, to keep the window open in the patient's room, instruct the patient to wear his mask when he's in other areas of the home, and the mother is to wear her N95 mask when she's in the patient's room because she was at this point still smear negative, excuse me, cultured, TST negative. The California Department of Public Health, California TB Controllers Association Joint Infectiousness Guidelines say that prior to meeting the criteria for non-infectiousness, TB patients may be placed in home isolation if the following criteria are met that the patient has started on a standard multi-drug TB regimen, no infants or children under five or other severely immunocompromised people are in the home, that all immunocompetent household members have been previously, who have, have been previously exposed to the patient and that the patient is willing to follow the restrictions by the local TB control program. And this just points out that you don't have to be culture negative to be released from the hospital it's important to assess each situation individually, but you still want to monitor the patient as appropriate to make sure that there are no, that doesn't look like treatment failure or that the patient has returned or is getting more infectious. In February of 2014, the patient has completed five weeks of treatment and phenotypic drug sensitivities are back and confirm what the molecular testing showed. The Specimen is resistant to INH, rifampin, and ethambutol, but susceptible to PZA, moxifloxacin, amikacin, capriomycin, and ethionamide. This is a strong regimen, and now peeling back some of the drugs can be considered, so the cycloserine was dropped. And now he's on PZA, IV amikacin, moxifloxacin, linazolid, and ethionamide. Now that the patient is on a strong expanded regimen, let's talk about some of the case management roles and responsibilities. The case manager has primary responsibility for ensuring that the patient adheres to treatment through completion of directly observed therapy, or DOT. The consequences of treatment failure and further acquired drug resistance make DOT a high priority. In fact, DOT is the standard of care for MDR patients. One of the benefits of DOT is that it allows for close monitoring of side effects and helps ensure adherence. However, it is a very resource intensive activity and requires more time and commitment as several of the second line drugs are better tolerated when introduced gradually or ramped up and may require twice or three times a day dosing. And also the use of an injectable requires a higher level of expertise, more time and more technology than that required by just watching a patient take oral drugs. And second-line drugs require an extended treatment length and monitoring for adverse reactions. This program 
use the team approach. Sorry. This program used the team approach. <clears throat> this pro <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. This program used the team approach and trained their health educators to provide DOT, which was done twice daily at the beginning of treatment. They also set up weekly medi sets and kept one full one at the patient's home and one at the health department. And that was just in case somebody was, whoever was responsible for the meds was out that day and the Mediset was empty, there was always a full one available so that there was no stress and worrying about um, who was going to be doing that. So in the beginning, the patient tolerated the treatment well without any side effects. After being home for a while, he began to experience some nausea and vomiting about 10 minutes after taking the medication. So here is our third polling question. Nausea and vomiting are often reported side effects of DR treatment. So I'm going to ask you to read the question and answer what do you think would be helpful in managing um, nausea in second, after taking second-line TB medications. Okay. Good, I see, I see, good. Okay, um, all of these answers actually have a place in helping manage nausea, and they should all be tried until one is found that works. So, you might want to ask the patient if they have any strong ideas about which medication might be causing the nausea and vomiting. In fact, a lot of patients do know or have a suspicion which one is causing it and will let you know. You can encourage them to continue to take the medication and, re and reassure them that for most patients, these side effects typically lessen over several weeks and may become more tolerable or resolve completely. This slide shows some nausea managing strategies that don't require additional medication because sometimes patients on MDR-TB treatment cannot tolerate even one more pill. And you can see they're listed here, eating a light snack before taking the TB meds, adjusting the timing of drug dosing without lowering overall dose, masking the medication odor by putting the pills or the crushing them up and putting them in the little gelatin capsule. Sometimes that will mask the odor. And you can have this patient keep a symptom diary to help better identify the time and pattern of symptoms. If this doesn't work, you can try using an antiemetic, providing a drug holiday, or if you think it's anticipatory nausea or anxiety, you can try a small dose of an anti-anxiety drug. You also do want to assess for other causes of nausea, including pregnancy and hepatitis. You can try a C-band or a suppository. So in this case, the timing of the ethionamide dosing of 500 milligrams in the morning and 250 in the afternoon was switched so that he was taking the larger dose in the late afternoon, and so nausea was later in the day and more tolerable. So now in September of 2014, six months after culture conversion, the injectable has been discontinued. In October of 2014, his regimen consisted of pyrazinamide, moxie, ethionamide, and linazolid, and these oral drugs were now all being given at the same time by DOT. But now the patient is reporting intermittent numbness in, lower, in his lower extremities. We have another polling question here. Which of these drugs may cause peripheral neuropathy? This is kind of a trick question. OK. I see we have a of at least one vote for everybody. So the correct answer is number five, actually, all of the above. And if you're wondering why the fluoroquinolones are on these, this list, uh, in September of 2013, there were major changes made to the package insert for fluoroquinolones. Peripheral neuropathy was added as a potential side effect of taking fluoroquinolone. So all of these, all of these medications can cause peripheral neuropathy. 
And our patient is on two of the four meds listed here who have, that have the potential side effect of peripheral neuropathy. We know that linazolid is a likely culprit, but we also know that linazolid is a very strong drug in this regimen, and we don't want to stop it without a compelling reason. Neuropathy is more likely to occur in patients with diabetes, alcoholism, HIV infection, hypothyroidism, pregnancy, poor nutrition, and with inadequate dietary intake of B6. Some ways to alleviate neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy are to increase the dose of B6 to a maximum daily dose of 200 milligrams, but you want to be careful here because there have been rare reports of neuropathy attributed to pyridoc to vitamin B6 doses of 200 milligrams or greater. So just want to be mindful of that. You can consider lowering the dose of the offending drug if you have an idea which one that might be. And you can also use gabapentin to help alleviate some of the symptoms. Neuropathy associated with linazolid usually tends to occur after about four months of therapy and is probably dose-related and unfortunately can be permanent. So there have been recent studies that show that lowering the dose of linazolid from 600 milligrams to 300 milligrams may be as effective as the larger dose, but with fewer adverse events. And that's what this program did. They increased the B6 to 150 milligrams, decreased the dose of linazolid to 300 milligrams, and there were no further reports of uh, neuropathy. Later in October, the patient reported to be vomiting between 30 to 60 minutes after taking his TB meds. Labs, lab reports showed mildly elevated liver function tests, and pyrazinamide was suspected to be the offending drug. Zofran was prescribed in this case with instructions for the patient to take it 30 minutes before the TB meds were given. This was successful, and so the regimen was not changed. PCA-related hepatitis can be seen later in treatment in MDR patients, so it's important to monitor closely with monthly liver function tests. If you find that LFTs are greater than three times the upper limit of normal and the patient is experiencing symptoms, TB meds should be held, liver enzymes should be monitored weekly, and then the TB meds can be reintroduced one at a time after the liver enzymes return to baseline. You also want to evaluate and treat other possible causes of TB. We find that drug-related hepatitis generally resolves after the offending medication is discontinued. So here's a very busy slide. This is a table of some of the more common side effects of second-line TB medications. For example, the injectable agents, tinnitus and hearing loss are very common. So it's very important to get monthly audiograms. Cycloserine can cause some depression or behavior and mood changes. So it's important to do depression, depression screening at baseline and then monthly while the patient is on this drug. Nausea and GI are upset. It's a very common side effect for almost all of the medications, but it's still important to assess and attempt to minimize any of the side effects. One more. So nurse case management of MDR-TB treatment requires careful monitoring for side effects, toxicity, and response to treatment. As the case manager, it is important to keep your patient well informed of possible side effects so that they'll know what to expect and can be partners in their therapy. Patients should be told that they will likely feel worse before they feel better, that their symptoms are likely to improve, and that there are ways to minimize the side effects. In many cases, some toxicity may have to be tolerated, although it should be treated and minimized. Often the offending drugs cannot be permanently discontinued from a regimen since that regimen is likely their best chance for cure. Since the nurse case manager is responsible for ensuring that all necessary monitoring is complete, having tools that can help with this are essential. A few years ago, Lisa created a monitoring tool that we send out to MDR nurse case managers. This particular nurse case manager took the monitoring tool and created her own version on the whiteboard that's seen here in the picture. So in this picture, she's keeping track of three TB patients on this board. She also, one of the more important things was um, getting approval for the medication. So she put the dates when that needs to be done so that she never was without approval for the medications. 
We thought that was very clever. So that's the end of my portion. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Lisa, and she's going to describe the case's contact investigation. Thank you. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Leslie. And um, yes, so you can tell that the case already is fairly complicated, and the nurse did a great job in identifying the side effects quickly and really managing those. So while that was going on, um, the nurse and others in the health department were also performing the contact investigation. So the case um, was young. He went to school. He worked and he was pretty social. So you can see this is a, a large contact investigation. The first polling question for this is a true or false question. I'll let you all read it. Oh, interesting. Okay, I'm going to actually read the question because I'm surprised with the response, so maybe it was worded funny. So um, the question is, the process of performing contact investigations for patients with MDR is different than performing a contact investigation for patients with pan-sensitive TB. Okay. No, you guys, that, okay. Okay, the majority answered um, false, and that is correct. The, the process is essentially the same. Um, so yes, most of you uh, agreed with that. So um, the one thing I would want to add, though, is that because the consequences of infection of MTB are more serious, it's important to take um, extra vigilance um, each step of the contact investigation. So I'm going to quickly go over the steps in a contact investigation. I think most of you will be familiar with these, um, but the first step is um, a careful review of the index case medical history and symptom history in order to determine the infectiousness of the patient and the estimated infectiousness period. Um, also, the next step is interviewing the case to identify contacts and identify locations where transmission may have occurred. And then importantly, doing field investigations to those sites to really see the locations, look at the size of the, um, of the rooms and the ventilation, if necessary, in those rooms to get a better idea of the risk of transmission in the specific settings. Um, next, once contacts have been identified, it's going to be important to prioritize the contacts for evaluation. Um, in this contact investigation, there were no young children or um, immunocompromised individuals but there may be in others, and you'll want to prioritize those for getting evaluated most quickly. And then evaluating the um, contacts is a, is a big and time-consuming step that the nurse case manager is going to be involved with. And then reviewing those initial um, baseline results from the first round testing is going to be important to assess the likelihood of transmission and give you an idea of whether or not you may need to expand the contact investigation. And then next is going to be looking at treatment for infected contacts, and then again reevaluating the results of your contact investigation. So I'm going to go through each sort of step um, along the way. Um, first is to talk a bit about infectiousness of patients with MDR-TB. So um, pulmonary MDR-TB patients transmit TB in the same manner as other patients with TB. And interestingly, most transmission uh, occurs before treatment initi is initiated. And smear positive cases are considered more infectious. Um, but as many of us have seen over the years, there appears to be some variability. And some smear positive patients um, appear to be more effective, uh, effective at transmitting disease. So it's really important to look at the results of your contact investigation to, to see whether or not transmission looks like it's occurring. And also, it's important that MDR patients get identified quickly so that they're started on an appropriate regimen as soon as possible. And for example, um, this patient was started on an MDR regimen 
within days of being diagnosed with TB because the health department suspected MDR and ordered a rapid molecular test. All right. So this slide um, has a lot of information. It summarizes the contact investigation results among the patient's closest contacts, um, the household members and also close friends. So I'm going to walk, walk through these. And as a reminder, the MDR patient um, that we're talking about today, the smear positive, had cavitary disease, and had been symptomatic for a long time before diagnosis. So his household included four people in addition to himself, and there was significant evidence of transmission in the household. One brother was a clinical case and started uh, and um, was um, treated for MDR-TB based on an abnormal chest X-ray. There were two converters in the house. Um, another brother was a documented converter and his mother was also a converter who became positive on second round testing. The father was an, um, a new positive, and there were two family members outside the household. One was an uncle who was, who, um, was also a new positive, and another family member outside the home was PST negative. The patient um, had a girlfriend and spent lots of time at her house. Um, so there is also evidence of transmission in this setting, but less extensive. So um, you can see there are two converters, the girlfriend and the girlfriend's nephew. Um, there were 23 folks identified associated with the girlfriend's household. So a lot of extended family members hung out at this house, and it was a really uh, a sign of, I think, really effective interviewing by the case manager that she was able to identify um, so many people and get them tested. So 19 out of the um, remaining 21 were tested and were um, TST negative. You'll note that there were two in this group who were not evaluated. And I'll talk a little bit later about some of the challenges in getting contacts evaluated. Um, additionally, five close friends were, were identified. They had done a road trip and spent a weekend away with the index case um, right before he was diagnosed. So some concern that the, um, their exposure might have been um, significant, but luckily they were all TST negative. Okay, so the contact um, investigation also included a work site, the hospital where the patient um, initially presented, and college. So the patient worked as a, as a cashier at a local store, and he worked up front. It was a large open space. But um, there was a small break room where employees took their breaks and had, and, and had their lunch. So it was decided to go ahead and test all the employees, thinking that there was the potential that they could have been in the break room um, together and that could be a risk, um, uh, could be a significant exposure. So um, all 16 of those were negative on first round testing. And I have 14 here who were negative on second round testing, but I believe actually the remaining two did get their second round testing finally, and so all were um, negative. So no real evidence of transmission in that setting. Um, the hospital where the patient was evaluated identified 15 contacts who had exposure to the patient in the emergency depart department before the patient was placed in respiratory isolation. And as noted here, there were three, I'll call them initial QFT converters in this group, and I'll talk about these results later. Um, the patient attended college during his infectious period. He took five classes in the fall semester, and each class met two times a week for an hour and a half. And um, each class had approximately 25 to 55 students per class. So as I mentioned, the importance of going out and doing a field investigation, um, the health department sent, uh, sent staff out and actually looked at the classrooms. And somewhat luckily, the size of the classrooms was fairly large, 1,000 to 1,800 square feet, um, so not tiny rooms um, where these classes took place. But one class was PE, um, a volleyball class. So um, the, the decision was to test all the students in the volleyball class and any students who shared more than one class. There was a thought that volleyball may be a setting with, um, I don't know, more um, 
breathing and, and also um, you know, changing in the locker room, that those students may have potentially had an increased risk um, than other students. So um, as I mentioned, 34 contacts were identified. And despite sending letters and calling students um, directly, only 16 students um, were fully evaluated. Um, of these, 13 were TSP negative, and there were three students who were positive but all of them had other sort of risk factors. All were foreign born from the same ethnic group as the index case. One was a prior positive, and one was a neighbor to the index case. Um, so as you can see, this is a very large contact investigation. And the health department was very effective in identifying contacts outside the household and, and getting most of them evaluated. And I think it was really important in this situation that they did do a large contact investigation because there was strong evidence of transmission in the household showing that this was one of those cases who was, I would say, effective in, in, in transmitting TB. So I talked a little bit with the case manager um, after the CI about um, what she attributed this, that they were so effective in identifying uh, contacts outside the household. Because I'm sure most of you of Earth and TB have come across that experience where um, cases, be it young or old, are fairly reluctant to identify contacts. And um, the nurse case manager said, oh, I just got lucky because the patient was really very open, you know, um, didn't have that stigma that, that is often associated with TB. But I think she was a little bit underestimating some of the um, good decisions she and the health department made. Um, first, the nurse who interviewed the um, patient initially was not actually the initial assigned case manager. Um, it was a nurse from the, um, within the health department who was from the same ethnic group as the patient. And she interviewed the patient as well as the patient's mother while he was hospitalized. Um, so it's hard to know how much um, the cultural connection played a part in developing a good rapport with the patient. Um, but I think we can all imagine it was probably an important piece um, of the puzzle. All right, so um, as I mentioned earlier, there were these three staff at the hospital who were initial converters, meaning that their initial, um, they used um, QFT test after exposure um, was positive compared to their baseline test result that was on file from their annual screening as a healthcare worker. So the hospital went ahead and repeated the QFTs on all three of these folks, and two of them were, were negative on, on repeat testing. One staff did have a positive up here. It's the, the nurse who did the respiratory evaluation had a positive QFT when it was repeated later. So you'll see that it was done um, on January 17th, um, just two weeks after the initial exposure and um, the quantitative result there, 0 0.8, it was done a week later, again positive. Um, so based on that, um, she had a chest x-ray and she was evaluated for treatment with MDR-LTBI. The healthcare worker de declined treatment due to concern about side effects. This person read about um, fluoroquinolones. This person was very active and was concerned about a risk for tendonitis or tendon rupture. The healthcare worker was tested again eight weeks after exposure. So that, that um, and at this time, both the QFT and the TFT were negative. So, um, I just wanted to share a few words about using IGRAs in contact investigations. The CDC recommends that IGRAs, such as QFTs in this, um, in this hospital, can be used in the same manner that um, TSTs are used in contact investigations. And the use of IGRAs can be really beneficial among contacts with a prior BCG history. So we don't have that sort of concern of somebody who's tested um, with a skin test who's foreign born and how does a BCG history and has a positive test and kind of wondering whether it's due from the BCG or the recent exposure. Um, and also IGRAs avoid the potential for immunological boosting observed with repeat testing that you do 
in contact investigations. But um, the chance of false positive conversions at eight-week follow-up testing can still, can still be a, a concern with IGRAs just due to some of the um, test variability that folks may have, have experienced. In this situation, it's not clear, at least to me, <laughs> I'm not an expert in the use of IGRAs and interpretation, but it's not really clear why one of the healthcare workers had two positive IGRAs after exposure and then a negative um, on testing at eight weeks post-exposure. But given that the um, skin test was also negative, um, we did not, or the health department, did not pursue, pursue um, further efforts to encourage LTBI treatment for this, um, for this contact. So to me, the take home message was really to um, consider reviewing the quantitative results and, and interpreting these kind of in the context of the exposure and evidence of transmission. And again, in the hospital setting, there wasn't really evidence of transmission, but um, I think caution was used because um, this patient was um, smear positive and um, there was evidence of transmission in other settings. Okay, another polling question here. So getting contacts evaluated. Um, what strategies have you used out there to get non-symptomatic contacts to MDR cases evaluated? So it looks like, ex awesome, half of the folks out here have really tried all of these um, strategies. So in this contact investigation, um, the percent of contacts fully evaluated was pretty good, especially in close contacts. 32 of 34 of the close contacts were fully evaluated, so 94%. But as you might have heard, it was harder to get some of the because there was no clear evidence of transmission in the work site, the hospital, or among college contacts who were tested, it was decided not to pursue those college contacts more aggressively. Um, but definitely there are situations when you have close or high-risk contacts when additional efforts are often needed to get contacts evaluated. And some strategies to consider for getting contacts evaluated include, um, as many of you noted, you're, you're using incentives and enablers. So, you know, incentives and, and enablers are not just for cases. Um, providing gift cards or bus tokens can be effective in getting people evaluated using health officer orders if necessary, depending on state laws. And in California, the local health officer may issue an order of exam for contacts, even if they aren't known to be symptomatic. Um, also, I want to stress the importance of trying to make the evaluation as easy as possible, and, and I think that can make a difference. In this situation, the nurses um, perform TB skin tests uh, you know, applied them and read them in the field and coordinated with contacts to have a convenient site for testing. As I mentioned, there were some large extended families, extended family, and um, the nurse said when she gathered people together, if there were going to be more than a few folks, she asked another nurse to come with her so she could do the skin test kind of quickly and be really uh, mindful of people's time. So sometimes I think those little efforts do make a difference um, in making it easier for folks to get evaluated. Okay, now the big question. So once contacts have been evaluated, um, how are con infected contacts to MDR cases going to be treated? Okay, another question, so, um, Leslie noted it's the, the results the, for this patient was that the index case resistant to INH, rifampin, and ethambutol. We had a number of converters, so the brother was one of them, a converter. I'm curious, what regimen 
um, would you use, with the caveat that nurses were not prescribing um, drugs, but we are looking to make sure that um, patients and contacts are treated according to um, recommendations and guidelines. All right. So it looks like um, most of you chose option two, which is moxifloxacin and pyrazinamide. So I guess everyone's already read the guidelines. <laughs> because um, <laughs> that's consistent with the, with the current guidelines. But I'll go through what we did in this situation and also um, what's currently in the guidelines and, and, and the literature. Okay, so in this situation, um, the brother, the two, the one brother was a clinical case, as I mentioned, and um, the other converters and new positives in the family were treated with moxie. So different than what you, what most of you answered, just one drug, a fluoroquinolone. Um, I will note that the um, one uncle started but stopped due to what was described as intolerable side effects. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the decision um, for using one drug um, for these adult contacts. And a little background on some of the considerations in treatment of contacts to MDR-TB. So in determining whether to treat infected contacts, um, it's especially important to obtain past TB skin test status to assess the likelihood of recent transmission. So I would say this is the one area within contact investigation for MDR patients that is, it's not different, but it's, I think, a little bit more important. Um, as many of you know, sources of the uh, TST history include looking at employment, school, or immigration health records. Um, so even though we don't always recommend that some of these low-risk occupations people get tested, going back and getting that information can be helpful um, in contact investigation. And so for an example, if a, if a contact had a documentation, had documentation of a prior positive test and the exposure to the MDR case was, was limited, you might not, you probably wouldn't recommend treatment with an MDR LTBI regimen in that scenario. So again, getting that, that documentation can be really helpful. Um, treatment for persons recently infected, like converters, is generally recommended because there is an increased risk of progression in the first two years after infection. However, because the treatment for MDR-LTBI has side effects and the efficacy of these regimens is less well established, really careful consideration is due to balance the risk of side effects versus the benefits of taking treatment. Treatment of infected contacts to an MDR case is based on the resistance pattern of the source case. So since this patient was um, susceptible to PZA, that was an option and is an, was an option for the um, regimen. CDC guidelines from 1992 advise treatment with two drugs to which the isolate is susceptible. And at this time, there are no randomized clinical trials to show clear efficacy of regimens. There have been some published case series showing poor tolerability of multi-drug regimens for MDR, LTBI, especially those including PZA. And there have been small studies showing that the use of just a quinolone, such as Moxi or Levo, has been well tolerated and may be effective in preventing progression. Also, not treating an infected contact is an option given the lack of efficacy data. And the recommendation is to monitor for two years with a symptom review every three to six months and chest x-rays as clinically indicated. There was a recent article published that summarizes the management of LTBI in pediatric contacts to an MDR case. Um, the exposure occurred because there was a teacher with MDR-TB. The teacher was resistant to INH, RIS, and EMB, so a similar resistance pattern um, to the index case we're talking about here. 
118 children were exposed um, in this setting, and 31 children developed LTBI, so, so quite a few. Um, of the 30, 31, 26 were treated with Levo and PZA following the CDC guidelines to use a two-drug-based regimen. And of the 26, 12, or almost half, had to change the treatment due to adverse effects, these including abdominal pain, arthralgias, myalgias, and elevated transaminases. So in the end, 15 children completed LTBI treatment, and there has been no progression of, um, to disease during the 24 months of, of follow-up. So in talking a little bit about addressing side effects to LTBI treatment, I'm going to highlight in this case, um, as I mentioned, the girlfriend's nephew um, was a converted, converter. He's 11 years old and had a positive skin test. And so he was started on levofloxacin, which is generally preferred of the quinolones um, for use in pediatrics because there's less experience using moxie in children. And the, um, the boy began experiencing knee pain, and as the mother described, started walking funny. And understandably, the mother became, um, became concerned about these um, side effects. The child was evaluated by a pediatrician, and the levofloxacin was, was discontinued with the plan to follow the child every six months um, for a full two years um, following the initial exposure. So there is a lower threshold for tolerating, tolerating side effects with LTBI treatment since the benefits are not as well established. So for example, if this was a, a, a case with um, MDRTB, it's possible that the clinicians and the expert involved may have been more aggressive in treating with the quinolone. But since this was for infection, um, the risk-benefit ratio was, was a little bit different. And I want to talk a little bit about the use of fluoroquinolones um, in children. Um, as many of you may know, fluoroquinolones are commonly used in children for other infections and considered well tolerated. There is a black box warning that highlights the, the concern for musculoskeletal adverse effects of tendinitis and tendon rupture. And there is a lack of data on the effect of long-term use of fluoroquinolones. This was a question that came up. Um, among those pediatric contacts in the school setting um, because quinolones are also, often used for a shorter um, duration for other infections. But I would say despite the limited data in children, fluoroquinolones are still recommended as part of a multidrug regimen for treatment of MDR and also for treatment of um, LTBI. And considering what the benefit of preventing disease may be in the future, and then looking at the risk of side effects. You know, if it's a minimal or temporary and unmanageable side effect, like nausea, you may want to push through. And I want to highlight, too, that managing side effects can be especially difficult, I think, for nurse case managers, because while we often have a case manager assigned to a case, um, Contacts end up being sort of an extra um, amount of case management, and the nurse, um, you know, is probably involved and may be working with a private provider to relay information about side effects. Um, it can be more challenging when the patient contacts are seen by a private provider who may not be as familiar with um, our TB medications and the side effects and this kind of um, risk benefit. Um, decision. Okay, so um, to summarize, um, just want to go back and, and kind of look back at some of the positive outcomes and highlight the role of nurse case management um, related to those outcomes. So um, first, just to give an update um, on the, the case um, that Leslie presented, he is actually still on treatment. Um, doing well and with no permanent side effects, which is important because unfortunately, as Leslie mentioned, some of our um, second line drugs can cause permanent side effects. So I like to say while we're 
we're, um, we want our patients to be cured. Um, we also do want to alleviate suffering and, and unnecessary permanent um, um, side effects as much as possible. The brother, the clinical case, completed a 15-month regimen without complications, and three family members and two friends of the um, patient, all um, you know, converters or um, recently infected, completed the MDR LTBI regimen. Um, so to highlight the role of good nurse management um, as it relates to these results, um, you know, I think we, Leslie mentioned how the nurse um, was very involved in monitoring both the response to treatment and side effects and really identifying those early um, in order to minimize um, um, discomfort and uh, really using a team approach um, for DOT. I think it was a great idea to involve um, and train other staff because you do worry about burnout in, in managing MDR cases because of the duration. It can be um, a bit overwhelming for the nurse case manager, so as much as possible to share the burden and, and use other staff um, is important and I think worked well for this case. Also noting that um, there was um, early identification of contacts and um, for example, the brother um, um, getting somebody on, through treatment who is a clinical case can be more difficult because um, sometimes without that um, firm evidence of a positive culture, it can be harder to convince the patient to go on treatment. Um, but in this case, um, there was great communication with the patient and the family and, and he did complete treatment. Um, also, I think it was quite a success to get this number of, of contacts through um, treatment for latent infection. And another thing I learned that the nurse in the health department did that I think made a big difference is they actually assigned a case manager um, to each of the contacts um, to help them um, get through LTBI. So the burden wasn't just on the, on the one nurse. Um, they really spread it out. Um, and I, again, think this um, made a difference. All right. So, um, just to highlight, um, there are lots of resources out there. Um, this is a plug for the um, Curry product, the, the, the um, survival guide. And um, Leslie and I pretty much call this our Bible and I think refer to it um, daily. And um, it is in the process of being updated, right? Old edition, yes. <laughs> yes. So the third edition um, will be out there. and. Um, and, um, but the second edition we're still using, and um, like I said, you kind of use it, use it daily. And also want to acknowledge um, folks involved in this presentation and, and, and the work of case managing. Um, so just a kudos to the nurse case manager and the local health department involved in this case, and also staff with our California MDR service, um, Gail Pennen Neha and Gisla, and uh, Dr. Randall Reeves in Colorado. Um, who shared some of his information on um, management of content. All right. All right, well, thank you very much, Lisa and Leslie. Um, and I did want to mention the survival guide revision. We expect to be releasing it sometime this fall. So um, coming soon, coming soon. Stay tuned. Uh, we're now going to move into the question and answer period. So you can see on the bottom towards the left of your screen, there's a question and answer panel. So please go ahead and type any questions in. Um, we'll address them as time allows. And the first thing we're going to do is to take a moment and check if there are any questions over the phone. So um, all the phone lines have been muted. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 6 to unmute your phone line and then proceed with your question. So I'm going to just pause for a moment or two to see if any phone questions come in. Okay, so um, no, no phone questions so far. If, if any phone questions would like to be asked again, please press star 6. We're getting a series of uh, text questions coming in. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, 
what is drug ramping? So this is Leslie. Drug ramping is a way to start the medication uh, without giving the full dose all at once. So for example, with um, cycloserine, the typical, the, the recommended dose is 750 or so, and you want to start out with 250 for a few days, make sure that the patient is tolerating it. Then you would bump it up to 250 twice a day, make sure the patient's tolerating it, and then again bump it up to uh, 500 milligrams all at once. And then if the patient is doing okay and you, if you get a level and you find the level is normal, you can stop there. Otherwise, you'd want to add another 250 to get it up to 750. So that's drug ramping. And there are a few that you do it to, there are a few drugs that you use the ramping with just because of the tolerability effects. Great. Thank you. Um, for the next text question, uh, what is the duration of LTBI treatment for contacts of MDR-TB? <laughs> Great. This is Lisa. Thanks. I'm glad you asked that because I realized that was a, um, a big omission in the, in the slides. So um, the CDC guidelines recommend a duration of 6 to 12 months. Um, in California, we typically um, go right down the middle and recommend 9 months. Um, duration for LTBI. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and another question, what is C-band? Oh, good. Well, a C-band is um, one of those bands you can get at CVS that are supposed to help minimize nausea. Um, people use them when they go out on the ocean and get seasick, so it, it sometimes helps with seasickness. It's just a little pressure band that you wear on your wrist. Um, we've tried it with some patients with varying results, uh, so it's not 100%, but it's always worth a try. Yeah, and also, as we mentioned during the presentation, we just hear repeatedly that patients just don't want to take more pills, so being able to try something that doesn't involve taking a pill, and um, we've heard um, that even pregnant women who suffer from nausea use C-bands, and some, as Rosie said, find relief with those. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is about a drug holiday. Are you okay with a client missing a DOT dose in order to attend a special event, such as a Chinese New Year, as the client is mentally affected by regimen? Uh, this, is, this is Leslie. Um, I wouldn't call that a drug holiday. I would call that a, a allowing the patient to skip a day of DOT, which is fine as long as things are going well and that you know the patient will be back, and then if you, you can add that dose on at the end of treatment. A drug holiday is where if somebody, if one of the patients is having uh, just so many side effects that they're just miserable, a drug holiday is stopping all of the medications for a week or two until things settle down, maybe more lab tests are done, and then the med medications are restarted. That, that's a drug holiday. Thank you. Let me pause for another moment to see if there are any phone questions. Again, you would press star 6 to unmute your phone line before speaking. Okay. Um, another text question. Um, what would you do if a contact in the house was very young uh, related to the decision to discharge the index case home? If there had been a patient in the, in the household that was very young, probably would, the patient probably would not have been discharged home. Uh, the patient could have been dis either kept in the hospital or discharged to TB housing provided by the TB program. Or uh, alternatively, if the child um, could go stay somewhere while the patient until the pa patient became uninfectious. That's also a uh, that's also something they could do. Thank you. Okay, we'll probably address two or three um, more questions here from the text. Um, next question: What is the turnaround time for uh, PSQ results, fiber sequencing results, yeah. and rapid sequencing? Oh, that's a very, very good question. Pyrosequencing is usually one to two days once it gets to the lab. 
uh, the, M, uh, the CDC's MDDR results, which is their rapid testing, once you get it there, it's 24 hours. So it's quite rapid and very helpful in uh, deciding what, what your regimen is going to be and how to start treating uh, for MDR. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a two-part question related to uh, DOT. Uh, one, were the MDR cases given DOT on the weekends? And did any of the DOT use Internet technology? Uh, I'll go ahead and answer that. This is, this is Lisa. Great questions. Um, in this um, situation, the um, weekend doses, as far as I know, which I'm pretty sure, were not given by DOT, but um, the patient was still advised to, to take weekend medication. Um, and video DOT was not used in this situation, so they did do in-person DOT initially twice a day, and then they were able to get the dosing um, so the patient could tolerate them in one-time dosing, which I think helps illustrate that um, when people, I think health departments don't have to be too concerned that they'll necessarily be doing twice a day DOT throughout treatment because it is possible for some patients to get a little bit more um, comfortable tolerating a regimen and taking all in one dose. I will say that we have patients out in California where health departments are utilizing um, video DOT for sometimes one of the doses and um, it's just that balance I think between patient-centered care, um, because some of these drugs can be so difficult to tolerate, some patients really like the option of taking at a time where health department staff may not be available for in-person DOT. And I just wanted to add one more thing. This is Leslie. We do have counties in California that will do DOT on the weekend for the initial phase, just to make sure the patient gets a good start. So that, that does happen as well. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Um, one other question. Is the criteria for home isolation used in California that you talked about, is that only for MDR TB or does it apply to all TB cases? <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, so we do have, we're lucky in California that um, we have guidelines around um, discharge regarding infectiousness and discharge to um, what we call high risk and low risk settings. Um, I just want to bring that back. There is the, the criteria for when to discharge for MDR patients um, is different in some settings. So if it's a patient going to a high-risk setting, um, there is um, the recommendation to wait until the patient's culture negative. For release to, I, I, to, release to home, which is not really releasing to um, not taking them off respiratory isolation, but I would probably need to double check, but I think it's essentially the, the same, um, even for pan-sensitive cases. They may return home, they're still under isolation, but there can be a situation where they could be at home um, under respiratory isolation, but a home visit and, and determining who's in the home, um, whether or not they're young children, and if there are, that they've been evaluated and started on window LTBI. Okay, and I think for our final question for today's webinar, is it okay to split the dose during the entire treatment? Uh, yeah, this is Leslie, yes. If, if, that's, if the patient tolerates it better that way, yes. Um, we we've, we've definitely do that. Yeah, the only caveat is that um, many drugs can be split, but not all. For instance, it may be, may be obvious to folks, but we're not splitting the moxifloxacin. That's a single dose and is given you know, once a day. But the uh, other drugs like cyclofurane, ethionamide, PAS, um, can be given in split doses or combined in a single dose if the patient can tolerate it. Okay, great. Well, Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes today's webinar training. Um, before everyone logs off, I would like to remind you to please complete your online evaluation using Qualtrics, and that email was sent to all registered participants uh, this morning. And for those of you who 
uh, shared your name and email address during the webinar, we will send you the evaluation link this afternoon. We really do value your feedback on our webinar and all of our training. And here is our contact information. Thank you for your participation.